From the Squamish Chief, this is the Squamish Sound. I'm Eli Cornell. This is our 27th episode of our weekly podcast. You'll hear the story behind the story as we take you into the newsroom. We'll talk about what did and didn't make it into the paper this week. On today's show, we're covering two new local candidates who have been declared for the federal election and the latest on the district's proposed plastic reduction. Plastic bags will likely be staying in Squamish. I'm Stephen Chua. And I'm Keely Bartlett. And a special thanks to our intern, Eli Cornell. He is the one that you heard giving the introduction to the podcast this week. So we have two candidates for our writing that were announced recently, and we're having both of them on the podcast this week. Very right. exciting. So on Tuesday, the mm-hmm. most recent candidate to put their name forward was the NDP's Judith Wilson. So she is the last major party candidate to be announced for our writing, and some people might recognize her name because 13 years ago she actually ran for the same party for the same position as MP for the West Vancouver Sunshine Coast Sea to Sky Country riding. I'm always impressed when you can say that in its entirety. You know it takes some practice (laughs) but let's get started with what Judith Wilson who is a lawyer based on the Sunshine Coast what is different for her this election? The last election, I think, was the the big election of how to get rid of Harper, and, and I think that was what was on everybody's minds, that we needed to change a government and who was going to do that. And in this writing, the, basically the, the vast majority of people who were looking for that kind of a change made their decision under the whole difficult situation of, oh my goodness, how do you not split your vote and all those kinds of things, and they ended up going liberal. Mm-hmm. Now we have a situation where, okay, what's what can we achieve in this election as a people? Like, wh- where are we going with all of this at this point? So while Wilson has yet to be Squamish yet for this campaign, she did say that a lot of the primary concerns she's hearing, she thinks, will be quite similar to the Sunshine Coast. And here are some of the concerns she has. I mean, in terms of what we can accomplish now, we need to make our Medicare better. We need to have the kind of head-to-toe coverage that was originally part and parcel of the dream of of Medicare. I mean, why should we not have Medicare for our eyes and our ears and our mouth, for heaven's sakes? The rest of our body is covered, but not that. We're Mm -hmm. saying it's time to move forward on that. And, of course, that also includes climate change. And I guess the other big, huge, looming thing that needs to be said is that climate change is not something that can be sort of left to one side. Climate change means that all of our policies have to be looked at from the point of view of how do we make sure that we integrate into our economic policies and our social housing policies and our government procurement policies to make sure that we're doing all that we can to move things forward in that area so that we are actually helping in the climate change Um, activities that are going to make it possible for us to have a future for our kids. So as we mentioned, uh, Wilson is a family lawyer, and she's been practicing since 1996. Hmm. So quite the career. And she spoke about how her previous experience as a lawyer is somewhat similar to politics, even though she does not yet have her own political experience. She does have a background on campaigns, not only her own in 2006, but also she was part of the campaigning party that helped get the first NDP member of the legislature elected in New Brunswick. So let's take a listen to why she thinks her experience in law is similar to politics and how that might help her. So I think the thing about being in law is that it helps with your critical thinking and helps you to, I guess, in terms of public speaking, you have to be on your feet, you have to be able to handle questions, and you have to be able to look at, you know, sort of not just the surface, but also what are the what are the bones of an argument, not just, you know, the, the bits and pieces they might say. Mm-hmm. I think that being a lawyer, for me, was an opportunity to help people. So there we have it from the NDP candidate. And now we can move over to another candidate. So while some may have not Notice that the Rhinoceros Party put forward a candidate. His name did appear on the party's website a few weeks ago. Well. Mm-hmm. But he has yet to officially announce that he is running. He did come by 
then that is Gordon Jeffrey we're speaking of. He did come by the Squamish chief office this week to talk a little bit about who he is, why he's running, and what the Rhinoceros Party's policies are. So the first thing you want to know about Jeffrey is that he lives in Whistler. Okay. He's originally from Ontario, but he's been in the sea to sky for about 10 years now. He's lived in, very briefly, in Vancouver, Pemberton, and Squamish, but he's spent most of his time in Whistler. And he is professionally a waiter, but he also skis, bikes, and has a dog, and plays music. So he's basically your average Whistler guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious to know rhinoceros party like it, it's it's a familiar term for a lot of us who are following politics very closely mm-hmm. here but some people might not be aware of what this particular party stands for mm-hmm. is there perhaps um a way that we could kind of sum up what what makes this party a little bit different from the rest of them well you know let's have um jeffrey mention one of their promises our main uh, promise is that we promise not to keep any of our promises, which uh, used to be a lot more amusing because now it's it doesn't really... That used to be the thing to set us apart from the other parties, but now we're just the only ones who are upfront about it. <laughs> we're thinking uh, increased, tra- increased public transportation and have uh, different methods. So for within cities, uh, roller coasters, roller coaster transportation along the sidewalks or where the sidewalks used to be. And then uh, I have masterminded the Super Mario pipeline for to, uh, <laughs> to fill the gap left by, by Greyhound and, and uh, you know, the lack of affordable you know, train service or whatnot in Canada. Um, so we just need to find uh, the Canadian Elon Musk equivalent to get it all rolling and then we'll be will be set but yeah so there's a need for transportation and the one thing all canadians can agree on is we all love pipelines (laughs) that's certainly different Mm -hmm. yeah so he mentioned that he thinks um that currently canadian politics has become a farce and so here he is buying fully into the farce and let's listen to why why he decided to run for the rhinoceros party i've felt pretty disillusioned with uh, our major political parties i've i've felt like none of them have really represented i don't there's no single party that represents my views um i, I really don't like the idea of uh, strategically voting like it seems like for my entire life everybody's just been trying to vote for the lesser of two evils and uh, I'm tired of voting for evil um, so yeah I think politics in Canada have become somewhat of a somewhat of a farce and that uh, the only the only logical thing to do is to spearhead uh, the rhinos yeah okay well <laughs> We'll see how that works out. Mm-hmm. Um, I did also ask him <laughs> what will happen if he wins. And here's what he had to say to that. I hadn't considered that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, all joking aside, I, I would actually uh, pull, pull, my, uh, pull my socks up and represent my constituents as best I could. But I would also have an absolute ball in the house. And any time, you know, someone put something forward that I thought was absurd or ridiculous, and it happens quite a bit, (laughs) I will uh, put something forth in the same vein twice as absurd just to to mock them. So there you have it. Those are the two most recent candidates. They're probably the last ones to be nominated for this election. So in our riding, all of the candidates are now officially campaigning, and you can read the profiles on each party's candidate on our website and we've had them in previous issues of the newspaper these two candidates their profiles will appear in the coming newspaper okay now we're bringing in our editor jennifer thuncher for her editor's pick she talks about one subject each week (laughs) that fascinates her and at this time it's going to be the proposed plastics reduction coming from the district of squamish um i'm just going to give you guys a quick background did you say hello to me 
Like oh, just hi. Oh, that's right. I should acknowledge you? your presence. <laughs> How are you doing? Hello, Jennifer is in the house. Thank um, you. Thank you. I gave you a tin bit. <laughs> I should at least get a hello. You'd not. You need to give me at least three to get an acknowledgement. Okay. That's how it works. Here. Carry on. Okay. So, quick background. Um, the district earlier this year asked staff to create a bylaw that would ban plastic bags and straws. And since then, staff have been coming back and briefing the district on how it's going. And over time, that ban has evolved into more of a reduction. So it's not outright getting rid of all of them. It's just saying, okay, maybe if we can't get rid of all of them in a practical way, maybe we can reduce them bit by bit. The latest development is they're no longer going to uh, try to wipe out all the plastic bags that you see in checkout counters or stores. Um, originally, the plan was to try to eliminate plastic bags at, let's say, the grocery when you try to, you know, cart them out with your food or when you're at the store, when you're trying to put your clothes in something or whatever you bought. Uh, they wanted to get rid of plastic bags entirely in that case. However, district staff have come back with them and say, saying there are two things you can do. You can prioritize eliminating as much plastic as you can and in that case, we can go with the option of taking out plastic checkout bags, um, or you can go with the option of trying to reduce as much greenhouse gas emissions as possible. And if that's your priority, eliminating plastic bags isn't the best thing to do because if you eliminate plastic bags, inevitably stores generally try to replace them with paper bags, and paper bags actually require more um, resources to manufacture and as a result would presumably create a higher carbon footprint. So the district, upon realizing this, uh, counselors just said, you know what, let's go with the greenhouse gas uh, friendly choice. And as a result, plastic bags will be staying, but it will be uh, on a fee based system. So from that point in, um, we're going to play you a little bit of what happened to the meeting. And one of the other things that a lot of people were interested in was what's gonna be happening to compostable and biodegradable uh, plastic bags? Right, okay. let's have a listen. Uh, unfortunately, both of these items are marketed as environmentally superior products and many of their advertised claims are in fact unfounded and might be considered a form of greenwashing. We've identified three possible outcomes when someone comes across a biodegradable plastic like this. Either they will think it's plastic and put it in the recycling, in which case it will be contamination. They might think it's compostable and put it in the compost, and it might break down, but then uh, these microplastics will go into the soil and thus into the food web. Or thirdly, they might rightly think that it is garbage and belongs in the landfill, in which case it will break down quickly and then get into the leachate even faster. So that was uh, a district staff member discussing the merits or perhaps weaknesses <laughs> about what is going on with those bags. Right. This whole story confused the heck out of me, which is why I called you at 7 a.m. yesterday when I was uh, editing your copy from the council meeting, mm -hmm. because I think it goes against what all of us felt, mm -hmm. which was you know, myself personally included, going to the grocery store, okay, I'll do the good thing and get the paper bag. Um, and so that's, I think, was shocking. So one of the stats, I don't know, I'm putting you on the spot, but was with cotton bags, how many times the cotton bag had to be reused? So according to district staff's findings, is 131 times. So you got to reuse a cotton bag 131 times before it becomes as uh, environmentally efficient as a single-use plastic bag. That's crazy. I don't use anything that many times. No. That's crazy. And then, like, th to be honest, there's, and to be clear, there's a difference between cotton bags and then the synthetic fiber bags. The synthetic fiber bags, um, you have to use 11 times. It's, yeah, it's so interesting. And I think at first blush, people don't, don't, aren't seeming to want to believe, believe this about the carbon footprint. So it'll be 
very interesting to see how people react to this in the district. The one that I'm completely guilty of uh, that was very interesting was about the compostable bags that you just played the clip about mm -hmm. because they sell them at the grocery stores, not just in Squamish, but everywhere that with the green little logoing, logo, logoing, <laughs> it's a word, um, and saying, put it in your organics bin, which makes my family happy because then they don't have to gag and throw out their organics. So I have switched since learning this and now put newspapers our newspaper after oh, I have thoroughly wow. read it into the bottom of the compost bin and that is supposed to be more environmentally friendly um, I'm curious about the poop bags for dogs hmm. did they mention the poop bags uh, they did not specifically say poop bags when they were discussing <laughs> this but they were referring to I guess uh, compostable and biodegradable bags as a whole so presumably that would include those ones then. presumably that would include those as well and um, basically according to district stats findings is that the, the there, there are a number of things that concern them. One was that people might be under the impression that, oh, it's compostable, I can just throw it in the woods. And that, right. would, that would create an increase in littering when they won't actually break down in the woods like that. It doesn't actually work that And we see that, that everywhere in Squamish. It's exactly. Uh, so that's, that's uh, one thing that they were concerned about. But what are dog owners supposed to do to be the most environmental? That is a very good question, and that was not something that was um, directly addressed during the council meeting. Investigative story, Stephen. Yes. What will... to do with the dog poop bags. Yes. Um, that will be one that we will be watching very closely. <laughs> Uh, okay, the good. next investigation. Thank well, you for I, that assignment. Yeah. I, I definitely thought it was, yeah, this is a big, big topic and glad we dug into it this week and interesting to see where it goes. All right. So thanks. Ciao. Ciao. The Squamish Sound is brought to you by the Squamish Chief. The music for this episode was produced by Stephen Chua, cover photo by Clayton Matthews. Have a story tip? Give us a call at 604-892-9161. Send an email to news at squamishchief.com. You can read these stories and more online at squamishchief.com, the newspaper, and have the news delivered to your door every week.